Hello, this is Frank Casey, and I'll be talking today about chasing Bernie Madoff. This is probably going to be the closest thing to a Shakespearean financial tragedy you've ever heard. People were destroyed, charities lost their money, icons were toppled, senior people in the SEC, the Regulatory Commission, had to resign, and people died. The story has a little to do about Harry Markopoulos and myself and actually chasing Madoff and why we did it. it has more to do with Bernie Madoff. It has a lot to do with the complacency, the incompetency, and in the latter years, I believe the complicity of the regulatory commission, the Securities Exchange Commission, and it has everything to do about the victims. So while we may have a laugh or two today, remember the victims, please. The story starts about 1974 for me when I was coming out of the military, I was going to make a, a career and I was an airborne ranger infantry captain and I was assigned to Massachusetts from Germany. And I decided to get out and to pursue a career in finance at Merrill Lynch. And back in those days, the brand new marketplace was the equity options market. It had moved from an over-the-counter exchange to uh, trade on standardized exchanges under standardized contracts. Everything is set except the price. And I declared myself a de facto expert in it and read everything I could get my hands on. And I began by writing covered calls to increase returns on equity portfolios. Now, a covered call is an option that you get, grant to someone. They have the right, but not the obligation to call the stock away from you at some price. You can write them, let's say the stock's at 30, you can write them at the money at 30, or in my case, many times out of the money, 35. 15% out of the money. And I might get paid a uh, dollar and an eighth, dollar and a quarter for that, depending on the volatility of the stock. But stocks go down. And I learned in a little while that you had to protect yourself on the downside. So what I would do is for clients is buy the right to put it to somebody else at a lower price, say 25, 15% out of the money. So I bought it at 30, I collect a premium, uh, they give it someone the right to buy it at 35. And I spend that premium and probably a little bit more to buy protection from 25 and below. Now I have what we call a collared strategy or a split strike conversion. That is an anchor point in the story. I go on to do futures trading, hedging corporate um, price risk um, in commodities. 90% um, of my book became oil and oil arbitrage. I moved over to the options on futures market in treasury instruments to hedge mortgage production for banks. And in November of 98, I landed up working for a firm called Rampart Investment Management in Boston. Rampart ran about eight and a half billion dollars of equity options business. So they were basically writing covered calls using mathematical modeling. And the portfolio manager was Harry Markopoulos. Now, Harry's a math whiz. Harry's a derivatives expert. Harry's a forensic accountant. And Harry's a hell of a lot brighter than I am. But my job was to sell the service that Rampart did to institutions, but to also help design new product. And I was asking institutions and wealthy individuals, what is it that you would love to see? And they all came back with the same story. Oh, Frank, just make me 1% per month like clockwork. No downside standard deviation, please. But as calm as you can, collect 1% net. Uh, right. I knew nothing could do that in the options market with any degree of certainty. So I began assembling teams of portfolio managers, uh, of um, hedge fund managers, and the, they did different things so that they sort of balanced one out in volatility. And then I had banks guaranteeing the return of my client's principal should I lose money. And so it was a structured note 
principally protected. And I thought it would sell big in the insurance arena. Right church, wrong pew, as they say. It actually took off among the uber wealthy in Europe and I wasn't selling to the uber wealthy in Europe. So I had to find a way of getting into that marketplace. And Harry Markopoulos says to me one day, you know, you're doing all this complicated work, a lot of complexity, a lot of moving parts. And a young friend of mine landed up working for a money manager down in New York City and he hired one manager. So he's a manager of managers, hired one manager that is producing 1% a month like clockwork. I said, impossible. I'm using 25 to 30 hedge funds. And he said, well, why don't you go see what he's doing? And I did, and the young man introduced me to his boss, Thore Megan de la Villiche. Now, Thore was a French nobleman and a nobleman, I believed at that point, and he had a 100 room castle in Brittany, and he went shooting grouse with the princes, and he was also a world-class competitive sailor. And I was a sailor, and uh, so we had some common ground. And he began asking me about my knowledge on options. And I was saying, okay, fine, we do eight and a half billion of this business and, and, and increasing returns on portfolios by a percent to a percent and a half per year. And he said, well, you know, I hired this manager and he's producing me 1% a month like clockwork. I said, well, who is it? He says, I can't tell you. I said, why not? He says, well, if I tell you and he hears about it, he will fire me as a client and I won't get this return. And I said, why would he fire you? Why is it secret? He says, well, he's doing the business tangential to his normal business and he doesn't want anyone to know. Ooh, I questioned that. I said, well, this is a hedge fund type strategy run by someone on the floors of an exchange. And because the Ray had showed me some daily confirms and they came in net. In other words, there are no commissions specified. So it is a block trader that's most likely doing the business or a market maker. And the market maker may buy the stock at 90 and sell it to you at a hundred. If it, the market's a hundred and you're willing to pay a hundred, great. Um, but they don't charge you a commission. So, Consequently, everything was price net and it looked like buy a thousand IBM, sell an OEX call and buy an OEX put. Now the OEX is an index of 100 of the top stocks in the S&P 500. And so he was buying component issues of that 100 index. He might be buying five or 10 or 15 or 20 of these stocks and selling calls against the whole 100 and buying puts on an index basis to protect himself. A split strike conversion strategy, the anchor point. So I said, well, what's this manager charging? And Thore says, oh, he charges me nothing. I said, hey, Thore, this is a hedge fund strategy. I would charge you 1% plus one fifth of the profits. He says, well, yeah, that's what I'm charging. So I get the commit, the uh, fees. I said, whoa, fantastic. Why is he not charging a fee? Well, he's just happy with the trading. But I'm looking at these confirms and Therese mentioning that he trades about a half a dozen times a year for a week or two sometimes. And that doesn't, none of this rings true to me. And so I say, okay, fine. Uh, then this guy is actually producing 16% or more because if, if he's giving you 12 and you're charging 1% to those clients, so one minus from 16 is 15, 20% of 15 is, is another uh, three. So that's four off the top, taken away. So 16 nets 12 and they're a last. You got it. I said, how do you get your clients? He says, well, you know, I know all the French and Swiss private wealth management banks and I provide them a retro session. Apparently a French word for kickback. He would get, basically give them some of this fee that he's charging for them to provide clients to him. And he was therefore investing in this secret manager. I said, well, Thore, this isn't like you have an account at Charles Schwab with a third party manager who is managing your money and Schwab is the custodian, Schwab may be the broker, um, but they have different departments and checks and balances and you're getting verified statements from Schwab on a monthly basis and daily confirms. I said, 
this looks like to me you are borrowing money from the wealthy of Europe and you're providing it as an unsecured loan to the market maker on the floors of the exchanges. He says, uh, but you really don't understand it. I know this guy really well. There's no risk in this trade. He never loses money. And so he takes me into the back room. And when he had showed me the daily confirms, everything was redacted. I mean, no names on the top of the things. They were blacked out. So I'm watching clerks type this uh, information, transcribing it into a computer. And I said, what's going on? He says, I want to make sure that these daily confirms actually show up on my monthly statements that my clients are getting everything they deserve. He says, but also I'm trying to reverse engineer. He says, this is uncanny. I've been trading with this guy for a couple of years. He gets out the day before the market goes down and he gets in the day of or the day before the market goes up. And he has almost 100% accuracy. Bullshit. This just doesn't happen in the marketplace. So I'm really suspicious at this point. So I said, well, okay, fine. Uh, he says, well, could you use this manager and raise money for me institutionally? I said, very possibly. We're building these structured notes. And so maybe he would fit into uh, the structured note. I said, it would be your management company and you would be investing on an anonymous basis to an anonymous manager, I should say. And uh, he said, I understand. I said, may I have this return stream? So he had a couple of years of investing with this guy. So I go back to uh, um, Rampart in Boston, but before I leave the office, I did something untoward. I spun a piece of paper on a clerk's desk. Bernard Madoff Securities. I didn't even know who the guy was. I came from the derivatives world, the hedging world. I wasn't in the block trading business. And so I didn't understand who Bernard Madoff Securities was, but I looked them up. And I went back to Rampart and I spoke to the big bosses and I said, listen, I may have a way of getting into the wealthy of Europe through Access International Advisors. That's Thoray's company in, on Madison Avenue. And he basically provides access on an international basis to asset managers. And he's got a secret manager and the guy's producing 1% a month like clockwork, but I have to be able to compete. And they said, well, that'd be fantastic. Let's uh, show them what we can do. I said, no, you don't quite understand. Before I left, I said to Thore, if I can compete, would you allow me to? And he said, oh, absolutely. As long as it's as good as his secret manager. And I said, well, how much money do you have with this manager? And he said, $320 million. Let me put that into perspective. In the spring of 99, if you were an allocator of institutional capital, you most likely would not, from a due diligence perspective, provide a manager much more than 10% of whatever that manager is already running. And that's to avoid event risk or manager blow up risk, right? You don't want to be fired. So I just said, institutions are conservative. Okay, if this guy's got $320 million with Bernie Madoff, multiply by 10, that's 3 billion plus. Let me put that into perspective. The biggest managers in, in the hedge fund land were running less than $3 billion, Monroe, Trout, George Soros, et cetera. And so here's the, a secret manager doing something on the side. And as a market maker, most likely, a floor, a floor trader, basically, and he is using unsecured debt provided as equity by Thierry Megan de, Vil de, de la Vich Villiche, excuse me. And this is big news. So I said, we have to compete. He says, well, what, what strategy? He says he says he's using split strike inversion, but he's not. I don't know what he's doing. They said, well, let's take it to Harry Markopoulos. He's a math whiz. So Harry, I swear to God, looked at this piece of paper with the return stream for more, no more than four minutes. And he says, Frank, come on, you're an options geek. You know this is a fraud. And I said, oh, absolutely. He's not trading options in split strike conversions. But what's he doing and how do we compete? He says, I'm not going to reverse engineer this. This is a fraud at the very least and probably a Ponzi scheme. I said, oh, my God, don't use that word Ponzi. I looked this guy up, Bernie Madoff. This guy developed the over-the-counter electronic trading system called NASDAQ. He is the chairman of NASDAQ. 
He is a block trader, a market maker. He is trading somewhere between five and 10% of the daily volume of, of the US stock market every day. We don't call this guy a fraud, let alone a Ponzi scheme, unless we have our ducks in line. Harry says, I'd love to take this to the SEC and blow the whistle on this guy. He says, so get me more information. About in the fall of that year, it so happened that I got a phone call unsolicited from a wealthy family out of the Carolinas. And they had sold their multi-generational business and they had created a manager of managers structure, a fund of funds in a way. And they called me up and they said, listen, would you meet us at the Swiss hotel in New York city? And it was a rather short notice, but I jumped on a plane and I went on down and we're sitting at the Swiss hotel and they have these low slung hassocks in the lobby around low tables. And they hand me a prospectus. And I immediately flip to the back of the prospectus because a prospectus basically says the manager can do anything to anyone, anytime, anywhere in the world using any instrument. That's what a prospectus says. So you immediately go to the back and you look at the addendum and there it is, manager A in a split strike conversion strategy. And he's an also ran, it goes up and down with the markets, which is what I would have expected. Manager B, 45 degree angle from your lower left to your upper right without a downside standard deviation. No downside blips, no losses. I said, ah, Bernie Madoff, who told you? I said, don't worry about who told me. He says, oh my gosh. They said, don't tell anybody we told you. And I said, I know, I know. If he hears about it, he will give you back your money. They said, well, can you use our fund in your strategy of, of structured notes? And I said, very possibly. Now, these people have been trading with Bernie Madoff for uh, many more years, maybe five years. So I said, may I have the prospectus? And they said, sure. So I took it back. And now Harry was excited because he had a, a, a return stream that he could model. He says, what we're going to do is prove to you that this thing is a fraud. I'm not going to prove what he's doing because he can't. But... I'm gonna to prove to you it's a fraud. Now, he, he says in this prospectus that the, the secret manager does this, he buys five, six times a year, boppity, boppity, bop. But what we're going to do is create a mathematical model that randomly selects 20 to 30 stocks from the top 100 stocks. We're gonna randomly write options on calls and buy puts, and we're gonna run that for four to five hours. He came back to me that day and he says, do you know what it produced? the treasury bill rate of return. And T-bills weren't earning any 16%. So we knew we had a fraud. We don't know what he's doing and how much this guy is totally running. Now I have to compete with this secret manager in order to get Thierry Megan de la Villachet's attention. And you can't compete with a fraud. If we produce a number, the fraudster makes up a bigger number. You can't compete. So we had to get rid of them. Now, that very fact that we were competitors against Bernie Madoff has been heralded by every chairman of the SEC. And I don't understand it. So what? We were disgruntled competitors. Yeah, maybe for a couple of weeks until we found out there was no way to compete. And this guy was an absolute cancer in the financial system. But who better, first of all, to figure out a fraud than a top competitor? They know exactly what the guy's not doing and what they're doing, probably. And they can at least point to the fact that the thing's a fraud. So in either case, um, we, Harry goes in, in May of 2000 um, to, and, and uh, May of 2000 to the SEC in Boston. Ed Gallison was the chief investigator for the SEC in Boston. He used to work for uh, uh, Fidelity at one point. He knew Peter Lynch. He understood capital markets. So he understood that this thing was a fraud, but all of his senior people there were lawyers. And in all deference to lawyers, great. If you need one, hire one for a special purpose. You don't put them in charge of fraud at the or in the capital markets. They just don't understand it. And so... Gallison says to Harry, keep it simple because they, you know, 
Of course, right away, Harry's into the third derivative removed and he's greasing up the boards and he's doing chalk on the blackboards and they're, I said, Harry, how did it go? He says, well, I gave him the eight page paper that we put together, but if blank looks were dollar bills, Frank, we'd be rich. Now we thought initially we might be rewarded for blowing a whistle on a fraudster. We quickly found out that there is no reward system or was none at that time for such and such. So there was nothing in it for us except to get rid of this guy and get Thierry Megan and De La Villachez's attentions. So we moved forward for a while and tried to uh, develop a strategy. Harry wouldn't uh, <laughs> reverse engineer, nor would he really come up with a strategy because he knew that he couldn't compete. And so Thierry Megan De La Villachez continued to grow. Now I, tried to develop some businesses with them that were totally outside of this range of split strike conversion competing with Madoff. I mean, we got into other things in the options arena that we might be able to do with him. And uh, so he and I remained friends for several years. And there was a later date, maybe around 2002, where I was having dinner with their aide down in New York City. And I and, and, and we were having pre-dinner cocktails. And I said to Thurry, I said, Harry, what happens if Harry and I are correct? He goes, oh, there you go with Madoff again. Oh my God. I said, he says, listen, I've checked this guy out three ways to Sunday. You guys just can't compete and, and you're irritated. And, 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 and I said, well, no, what happens if we're right and you're wrong? And he put down his drink and he looked right at me in a very solemn voice. He said, Frank, if I am wrong and you are right, I am a dead man. I kind of laughed a nervous laugh. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, let me put it to, to you this way. I'm the past president of Credit Lay and USA. I know every wealth manager in Europe, all the big bankers. I have all of my money in Madoff. I have most of my family money in Madoff. And the researcher after the fact told us that his family bailed out Louis the 14th. I mean, he says, I have every one of those bankers in Europe in it. I have one of the biggest heiresses in Europe in the cosmetic industry in it. And I probably have half the royalty of Europe in it. I have no out. And that's when you realize that a man is totally captive. He is made off. He's sold his soul to the devil. So I left Rampart and, and, and the end of 01 and I moved on down to New Jersey to join a hedge fund of funds. It was a very advanced fund of funds that we were really risk managers and I was raising money for them. And I was always keeping an eye out for a good hedge fund guy as well. And I traveled quite a bit to the conferences, et cetera. I quickly hired away Harry's right-hand man, Neil Cello. I threw his hat in our ring when we were looking for our first out, uh, analyst and he joined us. And so he was on the road as well. And around June of 2000, um, uh, Harry calls me and says, hey, um, I found a, a way of competing with Mayoff. I said, my God. I said, you got to get down to New Jersey. I've got to see this. So he says, okay, fine, I'm on my way. So he comes down and it was 2002, excuse me. And so he shows me the perspectives and we know what that says, right? So I go right to the back and, and I said, oh my God, Harry, if you get out of bed on the wrong side of bed on the last day of trading of these, these options, index options, why your client could lose 25, 30% of their capital. He goes, oh no, 50. I want 50% on one day. Who would do this? He says, oh, Thierry Megan de la Villache might do it. It really produces a higher rate of return than Madoff. It's a little more risky, but he says, I think I can handle the risk. I said, oh my God, call me when it's over. So he goes off to Europe and he was traveling around and he uh, goes with the Ray Megan de Villachet to the Champs-Élysées. 
and they're standing under the Arc de Triomphe. And, 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 and Thierry says, look up at the names emblazoned under Napoleon, Megon. Thierry's middle name is up there. And all the other names are starting to ring a bell. And Harry takes out his appointment schedule for the next week, 12 different, uh, 20 different banks. They're all there. These guys are the descendants of the field marshals and admirals of Napoleon, and they run the banks of Europe. So in either case, Harry goes out to the banks. And on the first bank he sees, uh, they say, you know, this is a pretty good strategy, Harry, but it's better returns than Madoff, but more risk than Madoff, and it's not worth the trade-off. You know, Madoff's closed. And by the way, we heard that from the first day we began hunting Madoff in, in, in early 2000. There, he was always closed and very selective. But this banker, the first one said, he's closed, you know, to new money, but he takes our money at XYZ in Geneva and our money only. Now, if you hear that once, maybe. You heard it twice. Mm. Heard it three times, implausible. Heard it 14 out of 20 times. They're the only ones with access to the secret manager, Madoff. Harry calls me up, he's in a panic. He says, man, this thing is really big in Europe and this thing is getting dangerous. Here's the way I looked at it. Madoff was a capo, a crime syndicate manager. He was the head of an octopus. He had his head in the crevice, hidden. He had long tentacles that came out and those tentacles were the feeder funds or a little bit of shade included, that were sucking in the victims or the investors into the mouth of the octopus. And those tentacles were charging 1% and one fifth of the profits. They were making a ton of money. They were making two to 4% per year on the amount of money that they've raised for them annually. And this thing was growing faster than the devil. It was a cancer. Now, after Harry in, 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 in 2000 went in to see um, uh, the SEC in Boston, they said, hey, we'll put a cover letter on it. You know, this guy's out of New York. We'll send it down to New York and it's their problem. We didn't hear anything. And so Harry says, well, let's call some papers and get someone to, to divulge that this guy's a fraud. Well, nobody would. We didn't have a smoking gun, they would say. You have innuendos. While we're building this mosaic of intelligence, I'd say, and, you know, we're putting this picture together from fragments all over the world, and they weren't interested. So Harry said, well, go find an investigative reporter. You just don't look for them in the yellow pages, you know. And so in those days, especially in finance. So I'm speaking in Barcelona at a structured note conference, and I brought my wife with me, and we were in the cab leaving the airport, and there's a rap on the window. And on the passenger side, and this harried individual was yelling, are you going to the conference? I'd like to go with you, share a cab. I can't get a cab. I said, oh, sure, jump in. So he jumps in the front seat. And I say, hi, Frank Casey and my wife, Judith, we're going to the uh, conference. And he says, hey, Michael Ocrant is speaking at my conference. I said, oh, who are you with? And he says, Mar Hedge. Now, I knew managed account report Hedge was the de, de facto expert on hedge funds at that time. They had the world's largest database on hedge funds. Everybody reported to them. And so I knew that this guy was a source of intelligence that we might be able to use in our hunt for Madoff. I said, well, Michael, what else do you do? What do you love to do? And he said, oh, people don't really know this about me, but I love investigative reporting. Thank you, Lord. I said, Michael, I'll give you a manager that's not in your database. That's two to two and a half times larger than the largest guys in your database. And on a risk adjusted rate of return is better performer, reward divided by the volatility than any manager in your database. He says, I'll take that bet. I said, now here's your out. I said, the manager himself is not a hedge fund, but hedge funds are structured for the sole purpose of funneling money to him. And it's a hedge fund strategy. He says, I'll still take that bet. I said, Bernie Madoff. He spun around so quickly. 
He says, I know Madoff. He doesn't run other people's money. He's a market maker. He uses his own capital. He leverages the devil out of it in day trades. I said, yeah, take me to dinner with my wife in Barcelona. And I'll tell you the story. Judy had the worst dinner of her life. Most boring dinner. I mean, I'm drawing on napkins and, and, and tablecloths, uh, the flow of capital around the world that we've been able to uncover so far. And, and, uh, and he says, you know, on the surface of things, he says, I'm going to write this story. But he said, I'm not going to call this guy a fraud. But I'll, if this guy is really this big and he's secret, and I've got to be, I've got to tell this story, but I don't understand options. I said, don't worry about it. We'll educate you. He was out in New York and we were out of Boston. So we did. And we gave him the name of all the floor traders and so forth and reference points. And he said, he called me up just before he was going to uh, print. And he said, um, you know, I've got to call Madoff to allow him to comment. I said, oh, he's never going to respond. I mean, he's secret. So, of course, he called and he called me back right after the close. He said, oh, my God, Frank, I hope you guys really know what you're doing. I said, what's going on? He said, I called Madoff's operation at, uh, at the company and he called me back personally. And the markets are closed. And he said to me, you know, people's careers have been destroyed because they didn't have the full story. And I've heard you've been asking questions about me. I'm getting feedback. So we better meet before you go to print. And Michael said, well, how about, as he's flipping through his calendar, and Madoff says, how about right now? And O'Cron says to me, the market's closed. Nobody's going to be in his office. And I'm going to be sitting with this guy that you're telling me is a major fraudster in the world. He said, I said, well, ask him the following questions. About three or four hours later, Michael calls me back and says, well, Frank, you got it wrong. He says, you know, I got into investigative reporting because I was raised by, by my uncle, who was a fraudster. And consequently, I learned all the biofeedback signs, you know, that if you're trying to recall, you look up to the right. If you're thinking up an answer, you look up to the left and 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 the pushback routine. If you get too touched, uh, touchy with them, they they push back aggressively. And so, in either case, he says he displayed none of these characteristics. It was like having tea with my uncle, my fraudster at the at the Ritz. I said, I don't know. Did you ask him the question? He says, Oh, I did. I said, Mister Manoff, I I hear from our investigation that you may be running $10 billion. I picked that number out of the air. I just wanted to see what the guy was going to say. And he said, Madoff kept quiet for about a minute. He says it was horribly uncomfortable. And he says, I'll admit the 7 billion. I said, we got him. He says, what do you mean we have him? I said, well, Harry's figured out that the world's exchanges and options wouldn't be able to cover 5 billion. And that daily trading that he would have to do in this stuff would be seven to 65 times the daily volume. And he's bigger than the marketplace. I said, did you ask him the follow-up question? He says, well, I was about to. He says, I looked down at the paper to refresh my memory. And I said, well, if you're managing that much money, no matter what the number was, if you're managing that much money, how come? And Madoff put up his arm, he says, Michael, give me credit. I'm, I'm not gonna be trading on the floors of the exchanges because you would see my footprint and you'd be able to reverse engineer my footprint and what I'm doing. He says, I trade with two swap banks. I said, which banks did he mention? He says, well, Merrill Lynch and I can't remember the other one. I said, they're not swap banks. I mean, they're not derivative. They're big houses, but they're not swap banks. I mean, if you, if you want to do a swap on a, a derivative basis, you go to Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, they're swap banks. And besides that, two banks, and he's running seven billion, he announced. Well, what bank do you know that's going to give an unsecured line to a floor trader operation for three and a half to seven billion dollars and not understand what the double the guy's doing with it? He says, You're right, I'm gonna write the report, but I'm not gonna call him a fraud. Made off tops, charts, traders ask how. All the statistics against his uh, database. We gave each one one another high fives.
Yes, here comes the posse. Nothing happened for three or four days. Barron's came out with a follow-up article to Michael Okron's article. Erin Avalund had been doing her own research, more from the secrecy side of things. And she quoted a lot about Michael's article and said, Madoff is so secretive, even clients are asked to keep mum. And she goes into the secrecy routine. Now, the SEC may not have the budget to subscribe to a technical journal like Mar Hedge, but they surely could have afforded 75 cents to buy Barron's. And so we just, we thought for sure, here comes the posse. Nothing happened for weeks, months. We were getting nervous. Who is this guy? I mean, we know who he is, but who really is he? Is it, how can he squash an investigation from the SEC? This doesn't make any sense. Harry then begins to descend into a bit of paranoia because he goes down to his local uh, sheriff and um, in the suburbs and he starts telling him the story and the sheriff listens to it and he says, I don't understand all the intricacies of derivatives and finance, but yep, you're gonna get popped. The feeder fund guys are making a hell of a lot of money. And by this time, I'm starting to pick up stories that maybe some of the investors are ex-KGB, FSV people, and they control stockpiles of raw materials in Russia, and they've been doing some dealings, and they're investing their money through Cyprus and moving it into Austria, and they're investing with a bank that's putting their money in Madoff. And I also had heard that Bogota, Colombia was another source of money coming out of Latin America into Madoff, these feeder funds. Now, you don't have to be much of a street kid to know that the boys from the FSB or KGB and, and Bogota have a unique method of manager termination. I mean, if, if they figure out that they're being ripped off and Madoff fails in any way, uh, he could be really facing the music. And surely these people that are raising money from these people would be the first ones that would be susceptible. So we figured that if Madoff figured out that Harry was hunting him, because they knew his name at the SEC. They didn't know my name or Michael O'Cron. Well, Michael Madoff knew that my, Michael wrote a story, but then he swore that he wouldn't get involved anymore, even though he was still working for, with us. And Neil Cello, we were covert. Harry was over and he was at risk. So he gets a, the sheriff says, you better get a gun license and here's a bulletproof vest. And Harry says, you know, I'm ex-military officer. I know they're not going to shoot me in the chest. They'll double pop me in the head and, so, you know, if it happens. So we continued to build the, the investigation, putting together the mosaic of intelligence. And people have asked why. There was no reward. We knew that it was a cancer, a cancer in the financial system. And it was going to take some very powerful people down and really embarrass the United States. And so we had to help in any way we could. We had our day jobs, but we would ferret out information and I'd be at, let's say a hedge fund conference in Zurich or wherever. And I'm speaking to you and you're a risk manager with XYZ bank in Japan. And we would be talking over a glass of wine. And I'd say, what do you know about Bernie? And you would look at me and say, well, what do you know about Bernie? Anywhere in the world, you never had to use the man's last name, just Bernie. And they wouldn't want to tell me perhaps that they were a custodian uh, that was, swear, was swearing to the central bank that they have those assets in the bank when they in fact did not, or that they were in the middle of the wire transfer business and uh, they were handling settlements and wiring money around the world and not uh, putting up suspicious activity reports, whatever. And so, I didn't want to tell them I was hunting Madoff, but we would do a sword dance and share a little information and both walk away happier. The investigation went on through 2008. In 2005, around late November, early December, 
Harry submitted his third piece. Now this one was 26 pages long and it had 29 red flags. These were not innuendos. Call this person, here's their contact data. They're the chief marketing officer for the options exchange in Chicago. They'll tell you that they would never seen the footprint of any activity coming from Madoff. Call this woman, she's the head of derivatives at Goldman Sachs. She'll tell you that this never saw him and has never done a swap with him and in the options market. We, would, we had things like, <laughs> here's how big he is relative to the total world market in options. It's totally implausible. Go ask him for his DTC number, uh, depository trust number, and to see if he's trading options. He wasn't. He didn't have an options dress desk. We couldn't figure out that he had one anyhow. So we were the biggest option traders at the time and we never saw his activity. So in either case, the, the, he submitted it with print like Titanic sinks, that large. The world's largest hedge fund is a fraud. Now, if you were in charge of investigations at the SEC in New York, do you think you might want to read that piece? Right into the circular file, disgruntled competitors. Stupid. I never knew anything about the individual investors, especially the Jewish investors. Now I knew that Ponzi schemes, which this was, it's a rob Peter to pay Paul. Uh, you take new money into your right pocket and you're shifting it over to your left pocket to cover debts and outflows of returns that you're really not making. And so I knew that those things are frauds of affinity. In other words, people have to have an element of trust. And I understood in the institutional world where, where we came from, that the institutional element of trust was there because he was a big broker dealer. He traded 10% of the daily flow of the markets and he was known as an innovator. And so he came up with this option strategy, but he wouldn't tell anybody about it. And so they just were happy and willfully blind to the whole thing because they were making tons of money from it. And so we understood that, but I never thought about the individuals. Why would he need individuals? I had more stupid banks around the world that were willing to wire billions of dollars. They couldn't get in enough investment. I mean, after the fact, when I became a forensic uh, plaintiff's witness, basically, I would uh, go through data and so forth. And I once saw an email said uh, from the head of a major wealth management bank a division of a major international bank, we have to get more made off. I mean, our clients are buying this like crack candy. They couldn't get enough supply. And so in the early days, and so why would he be taking individuals? But I was in November of 2008, early November, I was up in a high rise in Boston at a financial institution speaking to the head of product development. And I was showing him my wares in the world of derivatives. And he said, oh, Frank, way too complicated. Our clients are just not that sophisticated. It's not going to work. And I said, okay, fine. I understand. And I'm packing up my bag and I'm leaving. And as I'm walking out his door, he says to me, what do you know about Bernie Madoff? I froze. I spun around. Who are you? And I'm going to call him Abe. He says, you know me. I'm Abe from XYZ. Head of product development. I said, no, who are you? Are you an investor? Are you a feeder fund? Are you invested as a corporation? Are you joint ventured with this guy? What are you doing and why are you asking me? He says, well, I'm looking at this gray haired guy from the derivatives world. And he says, I'm thinking, who better to ask about Bernie Madoff? I said, but why are you asking me? He says, I'm going to tell you the story, but I need to know what you know. I don't want to taint your output. I said, I'm neither confirming nor denying that I know anything about Madoff. But if I do mention something about it and my name gets out there, I'm going to tell you I'm going to be seeking retribution because you'd be putting me at tremendous exposure risk. And he said, no, I understand, Frank, I'll keep my mouth shut. And so I told him the story in depth. 
And I said, now, Abe, tell me why you need it. He said, well, you know, I married probably the richest Jewish woman in the United States. She's the sole heir to a for family fortune. And at the wedding, Madoff slapped me on the back and said, now that you're extended family, I'm going to let you into my fun. And my new father-in-law saying, well, you know, you, <laughs> you have to take care of your, uh, my daughter, your wife now. And I have been invested with Met Bernie forever. I mean, we grew up together and he let me into his fund early and I have all of my money with Bernie. And you now should put your money with Bernie because I've gotten you access to Bernie. And matter of fact, that bank you work for, you probably ought to have them investing in Merck and Madoff as well. And he says, and I understand finance, but not options and derivatives. He says, you've got to tell me, put it in, you've got to tell me what you're doing. So I told him the whole story. He says, would you put it in writing? I said, oh, I don't think so. I don't want to pull it in the head. He says, exaggeration? I said, who knows? I said, we don't know the, the feeder fund capos and around the world. And some of the investors will get disgruntled as well. And I said, I don't think so. He says, please, I need to save the family. And I really don't understand what you told me. I went home, had a drink, had a cigar and a second drink and began typing the longest e uh, email of my life. I had 26 of the 29 red flags three pointed directly at me. And, and I scrambled them. I put a monster disclaimer on it. You know, a dog found it on a sidewalk, brought it, brought it to me unsolicited and I picked it up and read it, but I'll, I'll give it to you. But I neither confirm nor deny do your own due diligence. And I hit send. I didn't hear anything. 30 days later, I'm riding down my elevator at the high rise where I live in Boston and my cell phone rings and it's Harry and he's screaming. Madoff just capitulated and he named $50 billion, the exact number that we said he was running. In May of 2008, Harry had sent an email to the head of risk management, risk assessment at the SEC, who contacted him because he heard that maybe he should do so. And he said, we gave this thing to you at somewhere between three and $5 billion. It is now over $50 billion. You should all go burn in hell. And we meant it. We were mad. And so anyhow, he, he announced that he ran a 50 billion Ponzi. I said, hold on, hold on. There are people in this elevator. Let me go up. So I go back up and my second cell phone rings. And it's Michael O'Cromp, the investigative reporter. And he says, Hey, did you hear? And I said, yeah, I'm talking to Harry and we're doing one of these numbers. My cell phone, I mean, my house phone rings. And my wife comes to me and says, he won't say who he is, but you know him. And it's referenced this Madoff situation. And I thought, wow, some slick reporters already figured this out. So I told those guys I'd call them back and I put down the phones. And I picked up the house phone and he said, it's Abe. And I said, from the month earlier, and I said, Abe, and he almost was choking up crying. I, he says, I heard Madoff collapsed. You probably have heard it, and you're probably talking to Harry. I said, oh, yeah, and Michael and me, because he knew all the players. And I said, what happened, Abe? He says, I read, I put, sat my father down, my father-in-law down at the kitchen table, and I began reading that email. And I read, I swear to God, every word, because I didn't want to miss anything important. And the next thing I know, my father-in-law is bent over and he's had his head between his knees almost. And he was rocking back and forth. Who are these guys? Where are they finding this information? I mean, I don't believe it. And at the very end, he stood up abruptly and he says, I do not believe it. Bernie is my friend. He would never do this to me. We just lost everything. And I put down that phone and I had fist of rage. I was so bullshit. And I called up Harry and Neil and I said, <clears throat> we missed it. We were chasing institutions around the world, but we didn't even know that he was ripping off individual Jewish investors. Now he destroyed charities. He got Ely Wazel, the Nazi hunter. I mean, he got a lot of, I mean, he got some Hollywood people. I mean, that son of a bitch. So in either case, postscript, 
Harry and I talked several times right after Madoff went down about poor Thore Megon de la Villache. And should we call him? And I said, no, I'm really hesitant because it's going to sound like I told you so. And so a couple of weeks later, a week and a half later, Thore Megon, after he figured out he couldn't get his money back, locked the office door at night and slid his veins down and across. And when I was doing Frontline, the Madoff affair, Marty Smith, the producer said, what do you think about that? And I said, paraphrased, in my mind and maybe my mind only, this man was a hunter and a sailor. If he couldn't take the pressure, he could have feigned an accident. He chose the methodology of death that he did to atone for his sins of omission. Cut. Marty says, that was powerful. I've got to get that backed up. And he finds Thoreau's brother in Paris. And you'll hear his voice on that tape. It's a little old fashioned. But when you affront your clients and your friends, this is the way we handle it. In other words, they go out like royalty. And I cried. Thank you.